If you have your Bible, uh, would you open it up to Psalm 34? We're going to have communion this morning. And we're going to do something a little bit different. Psalm 34, many of you uh, may know and love this psalm. It's one of my favorites. That's not the reason I picked it, um, but it helps. Uh, psalm 34, a great psalm, a psalm of David. And um, it's for those of you who want to know these things, some of you don't, but I don't care, I'm going to tell you anyhow. It's, <laughs> it's an acrostic poem. Uh, that means that it, uh, there are 22 verses, and each verse begins with one of the letters of the Hebrew, or the, you know, in, in succession, successive order, uh, the Hebrew alphabet. You can't tell it in English, but it really does. Um, and uh, I, I, I guess there's about five or six other acrostics. Uh, Psalm 25, 34, 37, 111, 112, 119, and 145 are all acrostics. And, uh, I, and I realize that for many of you that just you know, quickens your pulse and your palms are all sweaty, but <laughs> I just wanted you to know that I, I study. So, uh, but this is a great, it's a great psalm. Uh, there are, this is one of those that even if you're not that familiar with the psalm, you probably remember uh, some of the great passages or the great verses that are in it, you know, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or the woman who trusts in him. The angel of the Lord, one of my favorites, the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. And there's a lot more. But the background to the psalm is really important to know as you, as you walk through this. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but it, 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 it's all had the background is happening in Psalm 21, or oh, not Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 21 and over into chapter 22 of 1 Samuel. And in that, uh, you're probably, if you know your history, uh, in, in Samuel and the life of David, David, of course, is uh, anointed by Samuel, the last judge of Israel. Uh, David is anointed as the next king. That's in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. He's actually, you can remember his age because it's the same chapter. He's 16 years old when he's anointed. It was done secretly because uh, Saul is actually the king at that time. But Samuel comes, anoints him at his home in Bethlehem. And then uh, the next chapter, chapter 17, happens about a year later, and that's when David um, takes down Goliath. And, and it's a very interesting story. I've got to be careful what I get into here, but it's an interesting story about how, uh, from that point forward, about how David is remarkable in Saul's eyes. Saul really loves him. He thinks he's wonderful, and then he hates him. He loves him, and then he hates him. He loves him, and he hates him. Uh, Saul is tormented by a wicked spirit. That's because he's really rejected the Lord in his own way. And so the Lord has sent this wicked spirit to torment him. And because of that wicked spirit, then uh, Saul is, is, he's going back and forth and he's, you know, he's throwing spears at David. He's doing all these things. David's finally on the run. A lot of things. Great story. He takes off. And by the time you get to chapter 21, he's, he's cooking. He's going as fast as he can away from Gibeah, away from King Saul, and he finds himself down in a place called Gath. Some of you may remember what Gath is. That's the hometown of Goliath. Of all the crazy places to go, why would you go to Gath, right? Now, I don't know how old you think David is at this point. We have this tendency to think, oh, he's really getting old. No, well, no. He's maybe very early 20s. I mean, he's going to be uh, 30 years old when he becomes the king. Of, of Israel. At this point, he's in his very young 20s. And so he's in Gath. And, uh, and of course, the, uh, some, of, uh, some of the guys there say to Achish, who's the king uh, of Gath, this, these are the Philistines. They hate Israel. And, and they say, wait a minute, this is the guy that everybody's talking about. This is the guy that, that, the, that, that the girls are all singing about. That, you know, Saul has slain his thousands, but, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And don't you realize who he is? When David realized he's busted, he starts going, he, he, he doesn't go nuts, he acts like he's nuts. So, so he starts kind of mumbling. And then, it's in the Bible. <laughs> You're right there? Okay, so, uh, 
you know, he, he's going nuts. He's like scratching on the doors and, and on the walls. He's letting drool run down into his beard. Uh, it's kind of like me after uh, second service. But, um, <laughs> and, and Achish says, do I need another madman in my, around here? <laughs> like, just get rid of him. And David splits. He takes off and uh, he heads over to a place called uh, Adolam. You could say Adolam. It's Adolam. Adolam is a cave. It's actually near uh, the Valley of Elah where, where um, he killed Goliath. But what matters is that at that point, David's brothers and their families, his mother, his father, all come around him because it, the word's getting out that he's the next king. And they come to him. He's in hiding in this cave. And as he's there, 400 men come and join him. These are men who recognize that David's the next king. They recognize he's the next king. And what they, you have to kind of get this picture. We read there in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22, verse 2, it says these 400 men were men who were men who were in distress, who were in debt, and who were discontented. Now, that probably describes all of us in one regard, but it's far more than what we think about. Um, when, when, when it says this, these are, these are men who have lost everything. This is the, actually, if I could put it, I want to get to the psalm, but, but if I could put this into a context, we'll understand. Samuel, if you remember all the way back in, um, in, in the days when the people were looking for a king, Samuel said, don't you understand what the king, the king you get and what he's going to do. He said, this king that you get, and this is pretty well described Saul, he's going to, um, he's going to take your sons for his army. He'll take your sons to plant his fields. He's going to take your sons to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war. He's going to take the best of your fields and the best of your vineyards and all the best of your olive groves. He's going to take your sons and your daughters as his servants, and he's going to take a tenth of your crops and all your livestock. So these people have been plundered, you could say, by the king of Israel. Saul was the people's king, not God's king. And he'd plundered them. And these men, when the word says that they were discontent, the idea is that they were men of, they were in high anxiety. Everything was taken away from them. It says they were in debt. It doesn't mean they ran up too much credit card debt. The idea is that they had probably mortgaged their fields and then mortgaged again, and they had nothing at this point. When it says that they were distressed, the idea, well, if, the idea is that they were really literally in Hebrew, bitter of soul. You get to that point when you've lost everything, when you're bitter of soul, that's who they are. And they come to David. Now here's a 20-something, a young 20-something. And he's surrounded by these men who are probably not 20-somethings. They're probably in their 30s and maybe even in their 40s. And these are, these are tough guys. They'd really like to throw off Saul. That's why they've gathered to David. They're basically saying, we're with you. Let's go get him. And, and you got to picture David surrounded by these 400, maybe like, if you want to picture it this way, Duck Dynasty guys. Okay, <laughs> big beards, they're ready, you know. And David trains them for war. That's what they do in the cave of Adullam. He trains them for war, and he trains them in godliness. And that's why it's so important, I think, for us to understand what's happening in the psalm, to understand the background. And so David then begins to instruct them. And he says, verse 34, we're going to go quickly, of course, but I will praise the Lord, or excuse me, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I'll bless the Lord. You know what it means to bless? To bless someone is to make them happy. Do you realize that we bless God when we worship him? And I want you to really think about that because there's a tendency in church nowadays for, for people to come in and just, you know, oh, the band up front, they're playing for me. It's like a nightclub act, you know. No, we're, they're leading us in worship of our God, right? 
and in worshiping him, when his praise is on our lips, not just I'm thinking about him, but actually on my lips and praising him, that blesses God, that makes him happy. Some of you struggle with the idea of, well, how can I make him happy? He's God, what can I do? Well, the Bible tells us that we do, so I think we should trust it. I'll bless the Lord at all times. His, his, his praise will always be on my lips. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. Let me ask you, what do you boast in? What does your soul boast in? If we're honest, I'm not asking for answers. But you ask it of yourself, seriously. What do you boast in? Deep down, what's our boast? We're all pretty prideful people. We boast in ourselves, we boast in our abilities, we boast in the things we know, what we own. Those are the things and so much more that we boast in. Wonder why we get in trouble all the time. My soul will boast in the Lord. It's an interesting thing if you, if you just follow that out. He talks about his soul. Uh, and just as an aside for homework later on, go to Psalm 42 at some point. You know, David writes that. And he's speaking to himself. You know, we think that someone who speaks to himself is crazy. But the Bible says we're supposed to speak to ourselves. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And then he instructs himself. Put your hope in God. Put your faith in him. Put your hope in him. Trust him and love him. We're to do that. My soul will boast in the Lord. The humble or the afflicted is probably a better translation. Remember who his audience is, these 400 rough and ready guys. He's teaching these 400 rough and ready guys. Remember, David was the runt of a litter, so he's, he's not the largest man around. And he's probably looking up to all these other guys who were there, they're ripped, they got their swords, they're ready to go, and David's saying, no, we're going we're gonna to work on swordsmanship, we're going to work on all those things. Because David was a, was a vicious warrior, you may recall. Even at the age of 22, 23, whatever he might have been at this point. He's going to teach them some things. But he wants them first. This is so important for us. He wants first to teach them what godliness is really all about. That our victory, you think about this, in everything that we do in our lives, whether it's school, whether it's the business that we run, whatever it may happen to be, our greatest accomplishments are going to come because our foundation is Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, you can always ask the question, you know, why do the wicked prosper? Well, God will take care of that eventually. But for ourselves, if you're in Christ, let's get ourselves first oriented in him, founded in him, in righteousness, before we move out into the warfare as a Christian or the, the work that we have in front of us. God will bless that. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The afflicted will hear of it, and they'll be glad. Oh, magnify, glorify is the idea. Glorify, magnify the Lord with me. He's saying to these 400, and I'm saying it with you. Let us magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. Have you ever really thought about how little we do magnify the Lord? Because in reality, so many of us, I mean, it's just the inclination of my heart is to magnify myself. And in the process, then, I minimize him. But that right balance in our life comes when we magnify God, when we recognize who he really is and we give him the glory that he deserves. Magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, he said. I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who looked to him were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him. And he saved him out of all of his trouble. I'm sure he's thinking back to Gath. The angel of the Lord encamps. Have you ever really thought about that? That we're not talking about, and there, there's no time to get into all these details, but we're not talking about angels as, as powerful and amazing as they are. In the Old Testament, that phrase, the definite article, 
the angel of the Lord. That's not Michael the archangel. That's the angel of the Lord, the messenger, is always a picture of the Son of God pre-incarnate, before Christ is born of Mary. That's, he says, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, encamps. That's the idea, right around us. You know, I don't know, if, I have found in my life, in the, you know, recently in my life, over the years, and I remember way back uh, when I was in business, when I was facing tough times, whatever it may have been, I always come back to this verse, that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. If you love the Lord, you fear God, he's right there. He's right there. He's with you. And he is for you. You may be like these 400 broke, busted, and disgusted guys in high anxiety, strung out, nothing left, bitter of soul because of what people have done to you. You come to Jesus for relief. He'll give you relief. He'll carry you through. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love that. You know, Jesus passes the taste test. Taste and see the Lord is good. He's good. And when he said, it's not, you know, when we think good, we have, or well, maybe you don't, but I have this, you know, we think good, we have this tendency to think not bad. You know, good, not bad. No, good as in the fullness, fullness, everything that God has to offer. Taste and see the Lord is good, happy. Oh, happy is the one whose trust is in him. The goodness of God is the fullness, the abundance of God. So often we associate God being good in the sense of, like I said, well, he's not bad. He's good. He's better than everything else. He's not just better than everything else. He's so far beyond better than anything and everyone else. The goodness of God is a place you want to live. You want to live in the goodness of God. Well, John, what are you saying? Are you saying that if I do this, then all my debts are going to be paid and, and I'm not going to have bitterness of soul anymore. I'm not going to have any difficulties. You didn't hear me say that. And I haven't read it from here. But what you'll have is the confidence that God has your life. And you won't want, in fact, he's going to say that, you're not going to want for anything that is in his goodness. If you trust in him, if you lean on him, it says you will be blessed. The happiness that comes from knowing the pureness and the goodness of God. Fear the Lord, you his saints. Fear him. Because there's no want to those who fear him. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not be in want of anything. That doesn't mean you don't want a bigger house. That's not what he's talking about. We're not in want of our needs is the point. There's no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack. I mean, you can think, you know, they're living in this cave. They probably heard the lions down in the valley. The young lions, we're not talking about the little kitty cats, the, you know, the kitten lions. That's what he means by young lions. The young lions are the strongest. They're the ones who are the most vicious. He says the young lions, they lack and they suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord, do you seek God? I mean it now, think about this. Do you seek him? Do you seek him? Do you, do you pursue him? Do you, do you follow after him? That's the idea. Not just know about him and have a few memory verses, but do you seek after him? Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good. Now, thing is added in. That's not in the Hebrew. They won't lack any good. The goodness of God, the blessings of God, you will not lack if you seek him. Ask, seek, knock, Jesus said. Ask, seek, <coughs> knock. If you seek after him, you will not be blessing. Now think about this. Think of who his audience is. It's not you. It's 400 tough guys. And, and most guys know that you know, 400 tough guys is a a rough group to try to corral. 
These guys are not ready for a Bible study. They, don't th they didn't come looking for a Bible study when they came to David. They came to David to say, let's go, we're going to kill him. David said, no, we're going to get it right first. And I don't know how they did it. Did they have Bible study in the morning and then sword and, and spear training in the afternoon? I mean, they weren't there for a weekend. It wasn't a retreat. They were there for a long time. They were training. These become, if you know your history here, the Old Testament history, you've heard of David's mighty men. That's who we're talking about. Why were they mighty? Not just because, hey, look, you've got Benaiah, if you know some of these names, Benaiah, Joab, Shammah. Some, some of those guys, these were tough guys. Who was it? Uh, Benaiah had a face like a lion. I don't know what that means, but I, didn't, I don't want to <laughs> see him. Okay. <laughs> It was Sh yeah, Benaiah had a face like a lion. Was he the same? No, Shammah was the guy who, um, who fought with a lion in a snowy pit. Like, that's a rough place. I don't want to fight with a lion any place, let alone in a slippery place, you know. And, but he killed the lion in that pit. These are guys no one wants to mess with. When David's point was, oh, you've got the muscles. You need some training, but what you need first comes here. You know, we have this tendency to, to think sometimes, yeah, I want to be surrounded by strong guys because those are the guys who are going to protect you. Well, it's okay to have strong guys and guys who have skill, but you, what you really want are men whose foundation is in Jesus Christ. They, they are founded on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Not just that we know him, but know how to live who know how to live, how to walk, how to talk, and whose, who, whose bodies and minds and spirit are in control, are under the control, in our case, of the Holy Spirit. That's why David invests so much time with these guys. So we're reading a psalm and we're thinking, you know, Good old David, he's just sitting here, you know, writing this cool psalm, thinking, you know, Calvary Central Bucks, they're going to like this someday. No, no, no. This is his instruction to those guys. He's training them, and then he's going to train them how to fight. Amazing to me that he even says, come you children. <laughs> he's the youngest guy there, I think. Come you children, listen to me, and I'm going to teach you the fear of the Lord. So like the first part was praise and now it's instruction. This is what we need to do. And by the way, that's important for us. That's why we're reading this this morning. Because we're in a society that is so, we all know the society that we're living in. And many of us, we look at the society and we say, well, you know, Come soon, Lord, I guess the rapture's going to be soon. And I, yeah, I do believe that, but you know what? <laughs> We're called to live in this society right now, not to hide away. We're to live in this society. And we need to know how to act. We need to know how to, if you will, to fight, how to stand, how to take our ground. And so it's important for us even to read this. Come, my children. Listen to me, I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Who's the man, who's the woman, who desires life, who loves many days that he may see good? You want to do that? Do you want to see many days? Do you want to see good? Then watch your mouth, he says. Watch your mouth. Put a guard over your mouth. Boy, that's instruction that works all across the ages. That works for everybody. Watch our mouths. James spends a long time in chapter 3 talking about watching the tongue. Such a great fire is started by such a little member, the tongue. When it's been said many times by a lot of people that it's the only member of the body that God gave us a cage for. All we have to do is keep our mouth shut and the tongue can't work, right? And we love it. We laugh about that, but we just keep opening our mouths and <laughs> insulting people. Or No. He said, watch your mouth. And for our generation, and watch our fingers. That's the, that's the extension of our tongues right there. <laughs> this, this whole other personality, but it's us. It's the real us in many ways, comes out on Facebook or on Instagram or whatever it may happen to be. No, we're to, we're to guard ourselves. Keep our lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil. 
and do good. Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no vile thing before my eyes. I mentioned it last week. We were talking about pornography. Men, not just men, women. David says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put any vile thing in front of my eyes. What do we look at? What do we watch? What do we long for? Depart from evil. Do good. Seek peace. Pursue it. Paul puts it like this in Romans 12. As far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, and that's all of us, as far as it depends on you, to the degree that we have any control over this, Paul's saying, live at peace with all people. Yeah, but do you know what she's like? Do you know what he's like? You know what he said? As far as it depends on you, on you, not on them, on you, live at peace. Yeah, but I live at peace. Live at peace. Why wouldn't we? Well, because we want, we want to be vindicated somehow? No, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, pursue it. The eyes of the Lord, ooh, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His eyes, his ears are open to your cry. When you cry out, God hears you. You may think, you know what, I haven't, he hasn't answered my prayer. How do you know he hasn't answered your prayer? If you pray, he hears everything you say. And the context here is he's talking about the righteous. The righteous. Many of those, those 400 guys, they were treated unrighteously. They sought the right thing in many cases, I'm sure. And yet they were mistreated. They were abused. They were ripped off. Back then, it's happened in every generation of, of history. It's happened right now. And in this room right now, we've all experienced it at some point. Betrayal. Insult. Being gaslit by somebody. We all experience it. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. The eyes of the Lord are on your life. His ears are open to your cry, so cry out to him. He's the one who's going to bring justice. He didn't tell you he'd bring just justice this afternoon, but he will bring justice. Justice is coming. There's no question about that. In fact, uh, just as a footnote, keep this in mind, look it up later on, Psalm 91. It says, you will see what will happen to the wicked one day. When God brings justice, you will see it. The righteous will see what happens to them. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. It doesn't mean it's going to happen today. His eyes are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. And the face of the Lord, man, there's a, there's a concept right there. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. For what purpose? To cut off any memory of them in the earth. Oh, God is just. He's going to carry it out. That's important for those 400 rough and ready guys to know that you guys can't work justice in every situation, but your God will. It's important for us to be reminded of that. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears them, and he delivers them from all their trouble. The Lord, listen to this. Many of you are here. The Lord's near to the brokenhearted. David was a broken-hearted man. He'd been ripped off. He'd been betrayed by the people he thought he could trust. In fact, the people of God, you would say, you know, in terms of King Saul and his family and all that. He'd been betrayed. He understood. But he understood that the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. In fact, you could make the case that the Lord is most near when your heart is broken. You may be angry, you may be weeping, but he's most near you at that time. Find your solace in him and find healing in him. 
And he saves those who have a contrite spirit. David's going to remember that. Years later, he'll write in Psalm 51, you don't desire sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, oh God, you don't despise. The idea of contrite spirit is one that's been crushed. See, a lot of these ideas sound so nice when we put it in religious talk, but it means crushed. And some of you are there right now. And I'm sure many of us in this room have been there one form or another. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. You say, that's not right. We're the righteous. We're his. We shouldn't be afflicted. Well, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The Lord guards all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil will slay the wicked. Those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him will be condemned. Father, we